Hi, I'm Amateur Ranger, and in today's video we're going to be reacting to Winnegoon's Dante's Inferno and the Nine Levels of Hell Explained. Um, a lot of this has been highly recommended since I made the Lost Book on Winnegoon and reacted to that. Uh, this has been getting recommended to me in like almost every video that I should react to the D Divine Comedy. Admittedly, I don't know anything about it, but I'm pretty excited about it. I know it's definitely a change up from the Lost Books. I think it's like a I don't know what the right word is. Allegorical. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but it's illustrative. I don't know. The way people were explaining to me. But again, I don't know anything about it. I'm very curious to see what it's about. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Hello, everybody. Today I'm going to tell you about the story of Dante's Inferno, as well as the description of the nine layers of hell that he talks about in the story. It's wild to me that this story isn't as covered as you think it would be. Because like between the different layers of hell and stuff like the seven deadly sins, it's one of the most referenced pieces of media ever. See, Dante's Inferno is a part- I know nothing about it. <laughs> okay, Learn it. let's learn something today. a greater work known as the Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy contains three parts, Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso, which line up with hell, purgatory and heaven respectively although inferno is the one everyone remembers because it's the one with the creepy demons and the suffering and all that stuff to understand dante's inferno i need to give you a brief description of dante himself dante alighieri was born somewhere around the time of 1265 in what is now italy dante became a poet and became particularly fascinated with old ideas of both greece and rome without getting in too much detail because both you probably don't care and i don't think i really understand Understand it as well as I like to think I might. Dante was alive during the time of the Holy Roman Empire, which making it very, very simplified and dumbed down, there was the Pope and then an Emperor, and the two were having fights back and forth over which one should maintain power. Dante was a very devout and firm Catholic, so he sided with the Pope, and whenever he lost a particular battle, he was banished from his home city. See, this was before Italy became a nation, so the way that it worked is people were much more tied to cities than they were their own country, and Dante himself was from the city of Florence. So Dante was exiled from Florence and pretty much lived off the graces of those who enjoyed his poetry, and it was during this time of exile, around the year 1317, that he published the Divine Comedy. <clears throat> Inferno was published, the two other parts were published here. Okay. Uh, quite the history lesson here. Joy. The original title of this book was just the comedy. See, the word comedy is very different now than it was at the time of his writing this or in the historical connotation. Comedy was a story that followed a natural order. In other words, bad things happen to the bad people, good things happen to the good people, and we can all feel good about it. So originally the title of this story was just the comedy, or in other words, this is going to be a long story and everyone's going to turn out the way that you think they should probably turn out. So he brought the comedy to one of his friends who was also a poet, and after reading it, his friend said it was so marvelous that he should rename it The Divine Comedy, <laughs> which talk about hyping your boy up. Now, something I need to make very clear here moving forward with this, a lot on the channel I talk about things that are serious inside of the idea of Christianity, or in other words, things that actual Christians believe are in the Bible, um, this is not that. You see, Dante, <laughs> who really liked Greek and Roman mythology, took a bunch of characters and inspiration from those stories, and then just threw them together with Christianity, and came up with all these descriptions of hell and its nine layers. And as we're going to see, and I hate even invoking this phrase out loud, but a lot of this was uh, biblical fan fiction. Like, Dante used a biblical setting, to not only put down people he didn't like, like literally half of the rebutals through this is just by naming certain historical figures and saying that they're in hell. Like for example, if me and you were in an argument and I was like, oh yeah, well, I wrote this book and guess what? Your mom's in hell. So, <laughs> top. <laughs> so basically it is like a lost, well, not like a lost book. Well, I mean, it's like its own theology, I guess, or he made up his own thing. So, I mean, it's kind of, from that i guess i don't know it's interesting because there's a lot of that so i mean i'm sure there's gonna be some things i agree with and obviously there's gonna be some things that are probably blasphemous so 
Here we go. Stop that. And I'm not kidding. Remember how I said that the reason he was exiled and wrote this book in the first place was because his side lost a battle to someone else? Well, he just says all the heroes of that other army are in the certain layers of hell that he describes, <laughs> but we'll get into that. Because the story itself was, you know, pretty divisive for that reason, a lot of people looked down on it and it wasn't really given a lot of praise at the time. However, hundreds of years later, whenever people began to read it, it became incredibly influential in the famous story that it's known for today. To give you an idea, in 1945, whenever Italy was in World War II and about to make their last stand against the Allies, they considered bringing the bones of Dante to the battlefield in order to aid them because that's how much he meant to Italy's spirit. And also, in research, in May of this year, 2021, they had a virtual hearing for Dante in order to historically and symbolically undo his exile from Florence. So a few months ago, there was a trial for this dead poet who invented the nine described layers of hell. And I wasn't invited for some reason. And I'm going to stay mad about that. So because this is such an influential story... And I don't mean to be that guy, but I feel like there are bigger issues than <laughs> trying to unexile somebody from many moons ago. I don't know. Because it's the start of October, and what's spookier than hell? I read Dante's Inferno so that I could come to you, not only describe the story, the layers of hell that not a lot of people talk about, some of the symbolism, and my problems with the story, because as we're going to see, there's a lot of them. But before <laughs> I talk about that, I want to talk about this. And you may be asking, what is ad? this? And the funny thing is, I don't even know. It's an ad what time. a lot of you probably don't know is that whenever I record ads for this channel, oh, yep. I'm not always go. sure of what ad's going to go with what video. So whatever's happening over here is a total surprise to me as much as it is you. So let's right. find out. A wallet that you can always trust to keep your cards. <laughs> all right, there we go. I'm watching your video. You get your ad. In cash secure at all times. And that's why today I'm here to tell you about the Ridge wallet. This wallet's got all my cards in it because whenever I started the ad with them a couple months ago and I put my stuff in here for the ad, I never took it out because I just like the wallet. I have the titanium. Ridge wallet gets around, man. Like, man, so many YouTubers get sponsored by them. I mean, hey, Ridge wallet, if you're out there, like, I could spot, you know, and black saying. model because I just like the slick color of it. But the Ridge wallet comes in everything from silver to this sort of burnt chrome finish and dozens of different designs and styles. Like, for example, mine has a money clip on the outside of it because it's sturdy and does an excellent job at holding in whatever cash I need. And the wallet itself can hold up to 12 cards, which I don't know about you, but I've never been in a situation where I carry 12 cards on myself every single day. But if you do, the Ridge wallet's got you covered. It's a super Super durable wallet that's even made with an RFID blocking unit in it that keeps your card safe from digital pickpocketer. Pick pickpocketers, yeah. But not only all of that, Ridge is so confident, as am I, that you'll like the wallet that if you get one, you have 45 days to return it and get your money back. I suggest the Ridge wallet to you because I've been using it and I absolutely love it. So if you're interested, I've got this discount code for you today. If you go to the link in the description at ridge.com forward slash Wendigoon and use the discount code Wendigoon, you'll be able to get your order for 10% off. Thank you so much to Ridge for sponsoring this video. It really does mean a lot, and I really do like your product. Thank you to everyone for watching. I hope you check out the link in the description. Hope you check out Ridge, and we are back to the video. Isn't that use code wind again? Interesting. Now you know more than I do. You watching this video know more about this video than I do currently recording it. Isn't that just weird? And speaking of weird, let's get into Dante's journey right. through hell. I think so. There's nine layers here. So, layer one, here we go. But first of all, and as always, thank you for watching. watching. The story opens whenever Dante wakes up in the middle of a dark forest. He's not sure how he got there, however, he figures it's best to write about the situation that he's in. He sees a way out of a forest up a hillside, however, whenever he tries to climb, he's attacked by various animals, including a lion and a wolf. That's Moments rough. later, Dante sees a figure out in the woods who he calls out to, before the figure identifies himself as Virgil, the Roman poet. Now, in real life, Virgil was a great inspiration for Dante and someone he looked up to. 
As a matter of fact, throughout the entire book, Dante refers to Virgil as master. Virgil tells Dante wow. that there's no way to get out up that hillside that he just tried to, and that the only way will be when one day the Greyhound comes to chase the wolves away. Now, while this video, I hope, is going to be a decent substitute for the story itself and the cool parts everyone talks about, there is no way I'd be able to cover all of the symbolism within the story. However, some pieces like this are a bit more obvious. So whenever Virgil says that one day the Greyhound will come to chase the wolves away, that is in reference to something known as Judgment Day, or the idea that within Christianity, at the end of time, Christ and God will return to Earth right. and get rid of the demons, Lucifer, and his whole entourage. So the symbolism right. of the Greyhound chasing away the wolves so that souls can freely climb the mountain is in reference to that. Virgil informs Dante that he is now woken up within the pit of the underworld and that the only way out is a walk through hell. Dante takes the news surprisingly well and then asks <laughs> Virgil how he knows this. Virgil says that an angel known as B the only way out through is through hell. All right. Beatrice gave him the information herself. Beatrice is the woman who Dante loved in real life, and now in his story, he's written her in as a holy messenger. And we're going to see a lot more of Dante incorporating themes from his personal life into this story. Virgil tells Dante that he can only take Dante through hell itself, and then after that, it is part of Dante's journey to walk through purgatory and then heaven, the other two parts of Divine Comedy. However, Virgil says that he himself cannot do it because he is a pagan spirit and therefore cannot walk into glory. Another thing about this is this story is also used by Dante in order to get across a lot of his religious beliefs. Like, for example, he says here that Virgil is a good man. As a matter of fact, Dante thinks of him as a great man. However, Virgil... think, uh... Sorry, I'm trying not to let the video run too long. I'm trying to get the information. There's a lot of information being thrown out of here, so a lot of backstory that I don't really know. So I'm trying to get all of that in. And I know I read a book about, I think somebody got sent. I don't know. There's a lot of books on hell. It's interesting. I know it's not that interesting. It's a hot topic. No pun intended. But uh, I read a book in like middle school. Some guy claimed that he went to hell. There's always a person that claimed they went somewhere. Like there's per like there's books on people claiming they've gone to heaven and they've come back and they write stories and then like three years later they're like, yeah, no, I made that up and I made millions. But <laughs> I don't know. He went to hell and there's all these demons. It sounds spooky and I don't know. It's again the Bible is not very um, clear. I mean, I, it says it exists, but it doesn't like give you like a walkthrough like here's hell and then here's heaven and this it's like it's hell is you know judgment it's torment i mean i guess there's not really a lot to see there so it's interesting that he was able to get nine layers out would be my initial thought to this is that it just feels like hell is a very miserable experience and so i'm curious to see what he tries to build on here but uh i don't know it's just uh when it comes to those spiritual realms it's interesting because there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of pastors who will preach on it and there's, it's just tough because there's not a lot of information to go on. Same thing with angels. It's like, there's some information there, but there's not a lot. And so, and obviously from what he said that Dante kind of just built his own beliefs on it. Like, oh, this person went to hell or that person. I don't know. And it's still true today, unfortunately with Christians, like they just kind of like assume like this person's going to hell or this person's going to heaven or whatever like i don't know it's weird it's i don't know what i'm trying to say here i don't know it's just heaven and hell bible makes it pretty clear you go one you know if you believe in god you believe in jesus that he rose again and you repent of your sins you go to heaven you know if you don't you face god's wrath because without um i don't know this is somebody sent me a paradox well, not to me. My friend Deets sent me like a thing about a paradox about God. If God's all knowing and this or that. And so I thought that was really interesting because when it comes to heaven and hell, so it's controversial because some people say, well, if God's all loving, why does hell exist? And it's like, well, you know, God is just and he is love. And so in order to get, when you sin, you face the just God. But because God is loving, he sent his son to die for your sins. And so he took on that punishment. 
So you took on God's wrath. And so if you give your life to Jesus, then when God sees you, he sees, you know, Jesus. He sees the blood that Jesus paid for you and you've accepted it. But if you don't, then you have the wrath. So that's all really the Bible says about it. It's not like, oh, well, here's where the demons are. I mean, it's just, I mean, hell's a place of torture. It's not, I don't think there's really much to say about it other than it's an absolutely miserable place. And heaven is an absolutely incredible place. So they're polar and <clears throat> sorry, they're on polar ends for obvious reasons, but I don't know. It's just, um, there's really not a whole lot in the Bible about it, ironically. So, but again, there's a lot of fan fiction out there and I think it's hard to claim anything that's written about heaven or hell. That's not, I mean, even when people claim like, oh, I went to heaven, I came back. Like, I don't know. I'm always, I'm already immediately skeptical with that. And especially since there's been so many fakes out there that have openly admitted that they faked it. But I don't know. It's just, I don't know what I'm rambling about. <laughs> anyway, heaven, hell, not that much in the Bible. So let's see where he goes with Virgil's this. Virgil's a Roman poet and was born and died before Jesus Christ. So according to Dante, that just sucks for him because now <laughs> he's stuck down here in the underworld forever. <laughs> see, as we're gonna see in a bit, Dante ranks the different sins or specifically the nine different sins by how bad that they are and then puts each of them in deeper layers of hell respectively. However, okay. someone like Virgil who wasn't guilty of- I do think there are probably, I mean, I said hell's an awful place. I think it's awful no matter where you go. I do believe there is probably worse places in hell than others. I think, I don't know. That's just my opinion. I mean, that's not my opinion. It's my theory. I don't actually know if it's true, but I do believe like somebody like who's committed something like really awful before or outright like Satan has a very special place in hell for him compared to other people. Like, I don't know. I think there are layers to it, not necessarily. But I mean, hell in general is just an awful place. Of any sins in his life is still cursed to the underworld just because he lived before Christ. So this is just the cards that he's been dealt. So Dante's scared that he's going to have to walk all the way through hell, to which Virgil scorns him and says that this message that Beatrice gave him was given directly by God. So God himself wants Dante to get through this journey, so Dante better get on this journey. So Dante <laughs> follows Virgil through the woods until they come across a large gate. Also, there's several different translations of this story. The translation that I read, people said was pretty good. So written above the large gate is this inscription. Through me the way is to the city Dolent. Through me the way is to eternal Dole. Through me the way among the people lost. Justice incited my sublime creator created me divine omnipotence, the highest wisdom and the primal love. Before me, there were no created things, only eternal and I eternal last. Abandon all hope, ye who enter in. This is, of course, the entrance to the gates of hell. Now, most of you have probably heard that last phrase, abandon all hope, ye who enter in, but the other lines are equally as interesting. For one, it opens up and says that through me is the way to eternal dole or eternal suffering. We get all that. But the part where it says that justice is the reason I was created and that my sublime creator did this as a form of omnipotence and quote primal love is saying that everything that we're about to see in the story and everything that we come across is just and what these people deserve for the sins that they have committed or at least what Dante says that God says they deserve for what they committed and a common theme that we're going to see through and uh, I don't know a lot of people say too with hell that it's you know God's unjust for sending people there because a lot of people say, oh, well, the prostitute or the thief will end up in heaven and then, like, the rich man and all this will end up in hell. And some people say, oh, well, that's a contradiction. But again, you have to understand God's definition of good is very different from our definition of good. Because, you know, no matter what, we fall short of the glory of God. God is so holy. I think to fully understand how much of a sinner you are, you have to first understand how holy God is. And then when you figure that out, it's like, oh, wow, I, there's no way you can live up to it. Because when God says it's good, it means it's perfect. Like, it has no blemish. It's not going to mess up at all. But, so, I don't know. There's a debate in Christianity, and there's always been a debate in Christianity, is, you know, is God just for creating hell? And it's, yes, because it's his creation. And 
whether we like that or not, you know, he created us. And so and I've always been of the opinion too, that God is righteous, not because he lives by, you know, his own opinions, but I, he lives by righteousness because righteousness exists. I think even in Proverbs, it says like wisdom calls out and it kind of treats wisdom like it's its own thing, which it's probably just an illustration, but I just think it's interesting how uh, that picture of God and wisdom and righteousness, it's just it, like it, it always existed. It didn't, it's not just like God said, okay, this is my opinion of what I think is good and bad. And even if he did, he'd still be just in that. But I think God just knows what is good and what is bad and that good and bad just exist. There's no such thing as, oh, well, God believes this, so therefore this is the opposite. Like, I don't think... I think God just knows. And it's just, just, I don't know if this makes sense, but there is good and there is evil. And it's not just like some made up thing that, and it's not just some made up thing that God made either. Like it's, it's always been there and God is righteous because he chose good. God didn't choose good. He is good. Does that make sense? I don't know. It's, I don't know. Before the creation is another very deep topic because it's like well who created god how did god come to existence it's like that's a whole different thing and it's like is good you know are the ten commandments just god's opinions or are these really rules you know are these like real rules i guess i don't know i mean obviously if god made the rules then they're important i'm not saying that but i'm just saying like when people argue my opinion has always been god is wise because he knows wisdom and he sought out wisdom because wisdom itself has always existed too. There's always been righteousness. There's always been wisdom. There's always been God. And then entered Satan and he gave us free will and he gave us that free will to go that other side because God himself, you know, I feel like could choose to be wicked, but he doesn't because he's righteous and he turns that away. But he gave us that choice too because in order for us to actually have free will you have to have the choice to leave you know you can't say you know you love someone when you don't have the option to leave them if you don't have the option you know to go your own direction you can't say you truly love someone or that you love them if you don't give them that option and so and then I don't know again it's just it's a very it's a very deep topic <laughs> and but yes, I firmly believe that God is just and a just God makes hell and a loving God makes heaven. And at the end of Judgment Day, you could decide which God you see. And in his life, you make that choice. Are you going to, you know, pay for your sins or are you going to let Christ pay those sins for you? So that's how I see it in scripture. Through this story is that sinners get exactly what they deserved in this never ending punishment. So Dante and Virgil walk in through the gate and make their way into hell. Upon entry, Dante says that he can hear every language and accent crying out at once. Now, before they even get to any of the layers of hell, literally on the path to get to the beginning of it, they come across this giant sea of lost souls. Virgil explains to Dante that these are people who didn't follow anything in life. They weren't good, they weren't bad, they simply were nothing. And among them is several fallen angels who also didn't commit themselves to God or Lucifer and simply existed. All of them, literally billions of people from all across human history, are chasing a giant blank banner which is symbolic of the fact that they never really followed anything in life, so now they're cursed in this sort of in-between state of the real world and hell to just chase after a meaningless flag forever. While they're doing this, they're constantly being stung by wasps and hornets, and it says worms all across the ground eat the tears and blood that come out of them. The idea being that people who lived meaningless lives are committed to an eternity of meaningless suffering. Eventually, Virgil and Dante walk to a river. That's interesting. It's an interesting picture. I think, yeah, that's, uh, what am I looking for to say? Um, it's true. I think that's something I struggle with too. And something I'm always afraid of is that chasing meaningless things because it's so easy to do, especially in the 21st century where we have like social media and we have all these 
things that are so easy to just say, you know what, I have this, you know, job and I'm just going to kick back and relax and just enjoy my life and, you know, that's it. I'm just going to live my way and no way and whatever. I don't know. I think it's interesting too, like what defines a meaningless life? And for me, it's just living for yourself and never growing. For me, it would be, you know, being, because I think for some, it would be like, oh, and again, it depends on your perspective. Like if you talk to a rich person, it'd be like being poor. And not every rich person is like that snotty. And there's some really good rich people out there. I know some really good rich people, but I'm like, I'm talking about like some like really, like I've heard, like I've. I've worked like private events with rich people and I, I've heard them talk about people who have like lower salary than the, lower salary than them. And it's, it's not good. <laughs> it's like, they just think it's beneath them. And they don't understand how anyone exists without money. And so for them, like a meaningless life is, you know, without money. But for me, in my perspective as a Christian, a meaningless life is, you know, just living for yourself and just wasting every opportunity God gives you whether it be to chase God or even just to, you know, you know, be a good family man, be a good friend, you know, somebody who's not a good friend, a good family person, who's not, you know, a good worker, um, someone who's just narcissistic, thinks they know it all, they never grow as a person, like they're the same person they are at 60 than the, as they were at 16, like they're just the same person, they just never grew at all, like I don't know, that that for me would be meaningless, that's a meaningless life. And I don't remember who said it. Was it Muhammad Ali? I don't know who said it. But somebody said that, and I don't remember the exact words, but it's when I'm 40, I hope I look back on my 20s and I think, you know, I was stupid. I don't know if this is the exact words, but basically like, I hope I've grown as a person by 40. Then when I look back on my 20s, I'm like, oh, wow, I've grown a lot. And that I was a foolish, that I made mistakes. Not that you hate yourself, obviously, you have that you grew, that, you know, that I look at myself now at 25 and I see myself at 60. I'm like, okay, yeah, no, I'm not that same person. I've learned some things. I made some mistakes. Obviously I was 16 and I didn't know everything I thought I did, but as a 25 year old, I can look back and say, okay, no, I've grown in this way. And then I hope at 35, I look back at how I am at 25 and think, oh, well, yeah, no, I made some mistakes when I was 25. But I learned from it, and now at 35, here I am. And then at 45, I hope I look at it in 35. And so it just keeps going on and on, on and on. And so you want to keep growing. That's what, you know, again, I kept emphasizing in the last books, like, challenge yourself, challenge your beliefs. Uh, you know, don't be narcissistic. And you see that in the Bible, and you see that with David praying to God, saying, God, search my heart, and bring anything that offends you to you, because you want to keep growing. You know, you never, as long as you have a heartbeat, as long as you have breath, God has a purpose for you. Even whether you're eight years old or you're 88, like as long as you're on this earth, you have a purpose. And that purpose doesn't end until God takes you home. And so every minute, every minute you live here, you want to make the most of it. And obviously there's a time to play. There's nothing against like having fun, you know, relaxing, obviously, you know, God relax. He made the Sabbath, but don't get so comfortable where it's like, okay, well, and this is kind of a place I'm in too, because you know, I'm a pastor and I work a second job, as I always mention <laughs> in almost every video, I feel like, but in the second job, why do I work there? It's a paycheck. Am I growing as a person there? I don't know. Like, that's a question I haven't asked myself. That's a question I've been talking to my fiance with. Like, I don't know if I'm really growing here. I don't really know. I feel like it's just a paycheck. And so it's easy to look at that job and say, well, it's a nice paycheck and um, I can pay, I can buy all these different things. But it's also like, well, is there something else out there God has for me that maybe doesn't pay as well? I might have to take a pay cut, but it might be more fulfilling and it might grow me more as a person than where I'm at now. Because it'd be easy to just kick up and say, well, this is what it is, and I'm just going to do it. So, I don't know. It's just always that, how can I challenge myself? How can I move forward? And sometimes moving forward means taking risk. And sometimes moving forward, you know, means being patient. And standing firm in what you are in. 
or you know like when I started the second job like I really hated it in the beginning and I stuck with it I'm glad I stuck with it but now as life has changed and I've changed as a person it might be time to make a change so I don't know it's it's a process and for me being living a meaningless life is just living for yourself and nobody else you know being a horrible friend being a horrible worker like just not being somebody you want to be around and no matter or not being able to take you know proper criticism not just like useless criticism but proper criticism like you know someone's telling you this because they want to see you change They're not telling you because they want to make fun of you or they want to bully you but like they genuinely are saying like hey you know you're doing this wrong and you know you're hurting us in this way and we want to, we want to see you you know be better and grow as a person i don't know it's just and again like he said like or dante said whatever you know just chasing meaningless pleasures and all these things i don't know it's just and you hurt yourself too when you do that because like i said if you are a bad friend if you are a bad worker you hurt yourself more importantly because no one likes you and <laughs> your job doesn't like you like i don't know you may when you only live for yourself you don't live for anybody else you make life a lot harder for yourself I think that's just the way it is. You know, you have to be willing to help others. You have to be willing to serve others. Because if you aren't, it's it's going to be a really rocky road for you. In which a bunch of people are waiting on a sort of dog. Dante can hear people <clears throat> around him swearing and cursing about the situation that they're in. As Virgil tells him this is the river Acheron. And then as they're standing there... Charon of Greek mythology rose up on a boat. Now, this is the start of something we're going to see a ton of, where Dante incorporates figures from mythology and then puts him in his Christian narrative. And just like in Greek mythology, Charon is someone who rose dead souls down the path to the afterlife. He tells Virgil and Dante that they are not allowed to get on because Dante is a still living person and that's not how this works. To which Virgil just goes, we are on a journey from God. And Sharon goes, oh, all right, get in. <laughs> As all the souls are gathered onto the boat, he tells all of them that now is a good time to start panicking and be afraid and then tells Dante that he's not supposed to be here. And then shortly after that, Virgil leans over to Dante and he's like, hey, I mean, he said you weren't supposed to be here, so that's a good thing. So whenever you do eventually die, you probably won't end up here. So cheer up, because Dante's terrified through all of this. <laughs> so much so that an earthquake happens, to which Dante panics and passes out. Whenever he comes to from passing out, he sees that the river they are going down is now on the edge of a cliff face. After looking over the cliff face, Dante can see what appears to be an endless spiral going down. And what he's actually viewing is the spiral of hell itself. Each layer down being a different level attributed to a different kind of sin. The noise he hears sounds like one perpetual loud noise, which Virgil explains to him is every soul crying out and screaming at once. So then eventually the boat moves on and arrives at the first layer of hell, Limbo. As soon as they come into this area, Dante says that the screaming stops and instead it's just the sound of sighing. And as he describes it, sorrows without any form of torment. Remember that thing I said earlier about Virgil, how he was a good guy, he just existed before Christ, so oops. Well, this is where all of those people go. People who were good people, but simply didn't follow the rules of Christ, were before Christ or something like being unbaptized, which was a really big deal in Catholicism at the time. Essentially, this stage one limbo is like Earth, only people don't die. And that's it, that's the only difference. There's no torment, no one's really being tortured. It's just the lack of hope and kind of the idea of constant nothingness or this is just how things are forever. So people roam and go about life with just existence. And again, these aren't people who's really done anything bad. They're just kind of here. Dante asked Virgil if anyone has ever gone. There was a, like, uh, Jesus told a story. And, like, it's debated whether it's a parable or whether it's a true story. My personal opinion is it's a true story. It's uh, Abraham and Lazarus. Or it's the rich man and Lazarus. One of those two. Um, but basically he says, well, there was this rich man, you know, whose rich life lived for himself. Yeah, and then there was Lazarus who was, you know, sick his whole life and covered in boils, but he believed in God. So they both die and then the rich man goes to hell and he's suffering. And then on the other side is, you know, Lazarus and Abraham. And 
they're not suffering, so they're just kind of there. And so there was just there was that in between. Um, I think I've heard it called paradise. I don't know. If that's exactly right. But there was that in between stage where Jesus hadn't died for sins yet. So even people like Abraham, who lived a godly life, they couldn't go to heaven yet because they needed Christ to pay the sacrifice, and then they could go. And it's also interesting too, because Elijah and Enoch didn't die, and so. But they went to heaven, so for the longest time, there was just two human beings in heaven. <laughs> there was nobody else until Jesus died, and then they could all finally go up. So it's, there There was that, but it wasn't like they just wandered around and they had no hope. Like, they had hope. They were looking forward to uh, Jesus coming. And that's what the rich man was saying, like, hey, you know, tell somebody that, you know, the torment I'm in, you know, warn them, tell them that the prophets were right. And then everyone's like, well, even if a dead man rose again, they wouldn't believe. And they already have the prophets, so they don't, why would they believe? Basically, they have everything they could possibly have to believe, but they don't believe. And so it's just, it's interesting. And again, it's that parallel of, oh, Lazarus lived a really rough, rough life, but he's there with Abraham. And then here's this rich man who lived, you know, an abundant life filled with lots of pleasures and then he ends up eternity in hell because he didn't he lived for himself and not for God. So again, like it is a scary thought that we have such a short period of time, but in this short period of time it echoes in eternity. What good or bad. You know, the bad echoes in eternity and hell and the good echoes in heaven. So you have to have that right relationship with God and you have you know understand who he is and how holy he is and that you live for the right reasons not just for yourself and don't live that meaningless life from this limbo into heaven and Virgil says that a lot did whenever Jesus died on the cross according to Virgil whenever Jesus died he came down here into this first plane of hell within limbo grabbed several of the Old Testament figures and brought them into heaven okay. among these a few of them are Adam Abel Noah, Moses, Abraham, David, and Rachel, just to name a few. Not only that, Virgil says that whenever Jesus came into this first layer of hell, it caused such an earthquake and rumble that it caused a fracture to go all the way to the bottom of the hell, which we'll see more effects of as we get into the story. While walking through this layer of hell, the two of them come across Homer, Horus, Ovid, and Lucan, all famous writers from Greek and Roman history. There is a verse too, and uh, I think it's first or second Peter it talks about preaching to the dead and I've seen people take that out of contents and be like oh well you know we'll just preach to the dead in hell until they eventually accept Jesus which I'm like I don't see that I don't again like when Jesus comes back and when he came the first time people rejected him and when he comes back the second time people still reject him <laughs> like people just don't want Jesus so you know when they're in hell even in the flames I think a lot of people will still be like, won't give their life to Christ. I think they just, some people will hate it and they don't want to give their lives to Christ. And so, but it is interesting because it is kind of like, you know, what did Jesus do in those three days when he died after the cross? Like, what, where did his spirit go? And so something happened there in that limbo stage where, you know, he preached or he grabbed the saints or I don't know, uh, you know, something did happen there. As the four of them are walking, they ask Virgil and Dante to walk along with them. Now, this brings us to a detail of this story that I haven't really mentioned up until now. Um, but it's a little bit pretentious. And I'm saying that as someone who's making a YouTube video about a story that you could easily just read for yourself. Like, for example, these four men I just said are famous figures from poetry history who Dante's big fans of including Virgil himself. So what happens is the four of them walk along and they're like, Virgil and the famous Dante, why don't you two come with us? And while they're walking, the other four are like, Dante, you're such a great writer. I can't believe how wonderful you are. And now look at you walking through hell. You know what? You're one of us. You're one of the greatest writers in all of history. Do you see what I mean by biblical fan fiction? <laughs> so then as the six of them are now walking together. I don't even know how you could write that about yourself. Like that's a severe level of ego. Like <laughs> here I am with these people I enjoy. Like 
Oh, wow, Andrew, you're so amazing and handsome. We, we're so glad that you get to walk through hell with us. Like, it's, I don't know. I'm just trying to imagine myself, like, I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> it's a different time, too. I don't know. I guess. Because if I, I don't know. If I read that in a book, I like he said, it's a little pretentious. Or he thinks it's a little pretentious to be making a YouTube video on a book. But I enjoy it because... You know, this is a book I wouldn't ever actually read in my free time, so I'm glad he's making a video on it because I enjoy it. I enjoy his thoughts a lot more because I feel like it adds a lot more value to it, and I would just be reading the book a little bit lost, but like I don't really understand what's going on here. So, but anyway, you don't need to feel that way when the is what I'm saying. <laughs> but I don't know. It's if I read that, and like I said, if I read that in a book, and I did. Well, I wasn't watching this video. I'd be like, oh, what is this person? Who does this person think they are? <laughs> Like, it's just the severe lit ego of that. I don't know. It's, I don't know. They come to this great castle wall, and whenever they walk through it, it's like this beautiful meadow. And while walking through it, we see figures such as Democritus, Hector, and Electra. Now, if those names sound weird to you, that's because Democritus was a real person who existed in Greek history, along with Hector and Electra, two characters from Greek mythology. And Dante does a lot of that in this story. He takes fictitious characters and combines them with real characters. Another character that he sees here sitting on a sort of throne is Caesar, who Dante really, really likes, but again, he was born before Christ, so he's technically in the first layer of hell. And whenever they get to the end of the meadow, the four people who were with Virgil and Dante stay there as they continue on their journey. And that's another weird detail. Like the four of them come up and they're like, hey, can we join you guys? Wow, Dante, you're so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye now. <laughs> so then they continue onto their path until they begin what is the true different layers of hell. While walking, they come to someone known as Minus, which is again a character from Greek mythology. Just like in his story within Greek mythology, Minus is here to judge souls and determine where they go in the underworld. Dante says that whenever a soul walks up to Minus, they can't help but confess everything that they've done in life to which Minus then throws them to the appropriate layer of hell that they belong in. Minus points out the fact that Dante's not supposed to be here because he's a still living person. Virgil says they're on a mission from God and they just walk by him. Again, similar to what we <laughs> saw earlier on the boat and something we're gonna see a lot more of, conflict rises, Virgil says God sent us, conflict unrises. <laughs> so after this, Dante and Virgil continue on their path and come to the second layer of hell, lust this layer okay. is consumed with great <clears throat> winds like that of a hurricane and people who are standing are constantly pushed back and forth never allowed to rest by the winds that they are facing and some people are thrown around so much that they're just floating bobbing up and down in the air every single layer that we're going to see of punishment has something to do with the way they lived in their real life so the idea with this one is that people who were torn asunder and blown about by the passions of love are now forced to spend eternity quite literally being blown about by mighty winds. Another inter And lust is a dangerous one, too, because I think, I mean, you obviously associate lust with, you know, love, but it can be other things. Like, you can lust money, you can lust power, you can lust fame. So, and I think everyone struggles with that. I mean, there's something every one of us lusts for. And I think... Again, you know, we're all born sinners, but we all struggle with different sins because we're all unique. And so, but the devil knows that. And so when we're tempted, he tempts us towards things we, he knows we lust for. And so that might be love. That might be women or whatever, but it might be money. It might be power. It might, you know, it could be any one of those things. So again, it, and I've said this before, I think in another video, but it's interesting how when Satan comes to Jesus to tempt him, what he tempts him with. And one of those things is power. Like, this will all be yours. So, he didn't, uh, you know, <coughs> sorry. He didn't try to, you know, tempt him with women or he didn't try to tempt him with money. He was like, here, I'll just give you all the kingdoms. Like, that was how the devil approached Jesus. But Jesus obviously said no. He quoted scripture. And he, you know, because Christ, again, he's in the flesh and he's supposed to fulfill the law. And so he's supposed to live the life that we can never live. And so... And then obviously being a human being, we are tempted by the devil. And so here's Jesus having to go through that same thing that we all have to go through. And here's the devil trying to tempt what he thinks will get Jesus, which is power. And it doesn't work. But again, it's just, 
I think James one says it too. Like we all, you know, God doesn't, you know, tempt us to sin. We're all tempted ourselves. Like it's in our nature. And when we become Christians, it's like we're going against our nature because we are in this flesh. And even as Christians, though Jesus died for our sins, it is still a pro it is still a walk. It's still progress, a, you know, a day to day thing where we have to continue, you know, trying to be righteous because we're not instantly made perfect. Cause there are some people who believe that too, where, you know, as soon as you give your life to create the Christ that you're just instantly perfect. But, um, I don't believe scripture says that I believe, you know, you repent of your sins and God forgives you, but then it's still a day to day walk of, you know, making sure you're staying on the right path. You're, you're seeking righteousness and again, God's forgiving. And so if you do go off that path a little bit, then you get lost or you get, whether it be for a day or it be for a year that, and when you come back to God, he forgives you, but it is a daily walk. And that's why as Christians, we don't beat our chest and act like we're the greatest thing ever. Because again, I'm not a Christian because I'm awesome and I'm just so much more righteous than everybody else. And that I just think I'm the coolest person in the world. I'm a Christian because I am lost and I'm the most broken person and I need Jesus. Like, it's not an image thing for me. Like when I tell you I'm a Christian, I'm telling you I'm broken and I need a savior. And that's why I'm a Christian. It's not because it's not some sort of like pat on the back. Like I'm a great human being. Everyone praise me now. It's I, I need a savior. And because I do have lust, you know, we all struggle with different things. You know, I've, I guess, especially as a pastor, there's a major lust for power. And, you know, a lot of people abuse it. A lot of people become pastors and they're very humble in the beginning. And then they get a little famous, they get a little success. And then suddenly they think, oh, well, I can do this. I can do this. And now people, if I say this, they do this. And so they get the, you know, they don't guard their hearts, which scripture, you know, warns about a lot. They don't guard their hearts and they let that sin in, let that lust in. And so they start pursuing that. And so... As a pastor, that's something I have to keep watch of. And that's something, you know, I pray God brings out of me that if I ever lust for power, that he immediately squashes that. And then, you know, it's just, we all struggle with sin is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and, you know, I think too, like we're born in sin. There's certain things that tempt us when we're teenagers. And like, as we grow as people, the devil throws other things at us because we learn from one thing and then there's another thing we have to learn from and then there's this other thing we have to learn there, or from so we have to constantly keep growing and keep guarding our hearts we can't just like say oh, i've mastered it all now and i'm perfect and i'm righteous and i'll never sin again no it's like i mean just in saying that you've sinned because you're completely arrogant but <laughs> but it's it's a daily walk no one's perfect we all need jesus and yeah we we all struggle with lust it's and so I think for me, it's always asking God, like, what am I lusting for right now? You know, am I, you know, keeping my heart humble? Because again, lust is too, like, not being content. Like, if you lust for power, you're not content with your situation. If you lust for money, you're not content with the money you currently have. Like, you know, the I would say the opposite of lust is content. It's being thankful for what you have, not just chasing... You know, power, money, women, you know, all these different things in the world that has that the world has to offer. But being content with what God's given you. Being content with the life God's given you. Being content with the job God's given you. Being content with the money God's given you. You know, being content with, you know, your political status or social status or whatever it is. Like, And again, like, there's a thin line between wanting to grow as a person and then like lusting for more. Like if you want to, you know, promote to a better job, that's not lust. Like you just want to grow and you want to work in your company. You want to work up. That's fine. That's not lust. But if you want to work up in your company because you want to, you want the power, you want to bully people with your power or you want to get away with things. So you want, you know, you want the top job to kind of hide your sins or whatever, or hide your, you know, illegal acts or whatever. Then that, that is, that is an issue. 
But, you know, if you want to grow, if you want to move up in your company, if you want to make more money, those aren't inherently wrong. I don't want to be, like, saying that or anybody misunderstand that. Like, if you want those things, that's fine. But as long as it's done in the right heart, like, you can want more money but still be content with what you have. So it's, but, like, if you just want money, like, you'll never stop wanting more money. Like you'll, even if you get $10 million, you'll want 20 million. If you want 20 million, you're going to want a hundred million. Like it with lust, it's never a filled. It's a constant chase. It's an endless chase and it's a miserable chase. Like it's not fun. And I've been caught up in that before in my past where there have been things I've been lusting for and I just keep chasing and chasing and chasing. It's just a miserable experience because even when you get it, then you're immediately moving on to the next thing, the next thing. It's just, it's a miserable cycle. And so, but when you're content, like you can chill, like you can be thankful and it, it makes your sanity a lot better. It makes your mentality a lot better. You're more enjoyable to be around and you're, you just enjoy life a lot more when you're content. You know, I still, again, like, I want to grow more, and I want to move up in life, but I'm not lusting for that. It's not the end goal for me, if that makes sense. I don't know. Interesting thing that happens is in every layer of hell, Dante asked Virgil to point out to him famous figures, and then Virgil's like, oh, yeah, well, that's that guy. He's famous. There's also <laughs> that guy over there. He's also famous. So, like, when walking through here, Virgil says, oh, yeah, those two, those are Paris and Helen from the Trojan War. And also, that character over there, that's Ditto. Ditto is a character from a play that Virgil wrote. So, like, I said the thing <laughs> that Dante combines fictional elements along with real world elements, but now he has Virgil, a writer of a story, being like, oh, yeah, that person, that's from that play I wrote. No, I don't see what's weird about this at all. <laughs> and then continuing to look at people, he sees the Mistress of Babel and Cleopatra. The reason he put Cleopatra here, not only because historically she's famous for lusty behavior, but also like most 17 to 23 year old males, including myself, Dante really had a thing for Rome. That's why Caesar was on a big throne in the past level. Like, sure, he has to be in hell because he didn't like Jesus, but he was still the leader of Rome, and Dante liked that a whole lot. So <laughs> as we're going to see, people who were not nice to Rome, Dante is not nice to in this story. And Cleopatra had a very big hand in tearing apart some of the leaders of Rome. So she's in the second layer of hell. Dante gets really sad at seeing people in this condition, and then asks to talk to two of them, who explained that they were lovers in real life or the life before this life and said that he was her husband's brother and that one day the two of them were talking and reading romantic stories and then kissed and then had a passionate affair to which the husband killed both of them. So now because they were lusty and broke the bonds of marriage and all that, they're here on the second level. And then in response to this, Dante passes out again, which I mind <laughs> you is the second time the way the story works is Dante falls asleep and we wake up in our next location. And third, counting if technically the opening to this whole story was him just waking up in the woods. I know I'm being critical of a story written in the 1300s <laughs> and a story that admittedly was incredibly monumental when it came to ideas of fictional storytelling. However, I can't help myself. I mean, I guess you gotta start somewhere, but yeah, like, <laughs> if it does this like nine times, it's just the same thing of Dante passes out and Virgil says, God wants him here. And then it was like, okay, yeah, that's fine. Like, <laughs> you do that nine times, like shake it up a little bit. Like you can do it the first two times, but like maybe like mix it up, you know? But I mean, again, it's a really old book and literature had to start somewhere. Can't be, you know, we had to. You had to start, there had to be a foundation, so we had to grow from something, I guess. He wakes up seemingly having been carried by Virgil in the third layer of hell, gluttony. In this level, it's constantly mm. pouring a mixture of rain, sleet, snow, and hail. So it's constantly uncomfortable. People are being pelted with ice. And then the most uncomfortable thing about it is Cerberus, the three-headed dog, is sprinting around and tearing people to shreds. Mm. But people wow. can't die. So what happens is Cerberus will pick someone up bite them in half, rip them to pieces, throw them, and then they just lay there in pieces and either heal up over the course of however many eons or just lay there like that. <laughs> also, an interesting detail is that Dante describes Cerberus looks pretty rough, like cut up and pieces of its stomach cut open and stuff like that. 
That'll be explained later. And as Cerberus sees the pair and begins running at them, Virgil grabs a bunch of dirt and throws it into each of Cerberus's mouths. Cerberus's mouths? Whatever. Which, like... <laughs> Like, did he do it all at once? Like, does he have three arms? Or was it, like, really quick? Or whatever. They sneak by. And as they're sneaking by, someone sets up and identifies themselves as Kiako and talks to Dante. And that's when he explains, everyone on this level committed acts of gluttony in life. So now we're forced to always be half eaten by this Cerberus creature. And what most people do is they lay down and play dead so that Cerberus doesn't get to them. Dante then asks Kiako if he can tell him what's happened i feel like with gluttony um like it kind of builds off of lust i feel like gluttony gets into that point of like the comfort zone which is when you are in a christian church and you hear you hear a lot about the comfort zone <laughs> but it's basically just this place of i'm here i'm happy with my life and i don't want to change and so you just like start indulging and I don't, it's like that parable of i can't remember the exact name but jesus tells it and the guy is it or is it in proverbs maybe it's in proverbs uh, but anyway it's somebody who's been mildly successful and it's like you know what i made it i'm building all my barns and all these things i'm just going to enjoy the fruits of my labor now and i'm not going to work another day in my life and then he dies the next day <laughs> which was the point of that scripture is you know you don't know the day or the hour so just you know live for the lord don't live for yourself because you don't know when the day or time is coming don't act like you know you have 20 years left in your life when you don't know if you have 20 minutes so make every minute count and gluttony you know it's overindulging it's you know it's it builds off lust to a certain extent like it's enjoying too much it's, it's that growing you're not growing at that point you're just indulging and so I've, it it does kind of build off that. And the dog is very frightening. <laughs> it's a very frightening idea. So, I don't know. That's just a quick take, I guess. Florence back on Earth. To which Kiyako says that all he can see is Florence's future and that there's going to be a lot of war and bloodshed. This is the start of something we're going to see a lot of as we get into the deeper layers of hell. But... Dante is weirdly concerned with like the modern political climate of the city of Florence, considering the fact he's on a message from God to walk through hell and heaven itself. <laughs> but he keeps being like, mm, how's the election going back home? <laughs> it also brings up another interesting point, because as they're leaving, Kyoko asked if Dante will write about him that he may be remembered. Now, while on the one hand, it's kind of pretentious for Dante to write in his story that the one thing these suffering souls in hell want is for I, the great Dante, to talk about them. But it does open up this interesting idea from a horror perspective of these souls are so damned and trapped down here. The only thing that they can hope is that they'll be written in books that they can never read. As they're walking away, Dante asks... It's like, uh, again, Abraham and the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, the rich man's just begging... For Lazarus to just like dip his toe in the water and he'll just like lick the drops off his feet. Like it's just, again, hell is an awful place. So there's just nothing good about it. And again, like this version of hell, I feel like is tame versus the one in the Bible, which is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's just uh, like originally, or then I was like, oh, everybody's screaming out in their own like language, but I don't even know if there is a language in hell. I think it's just, it's screaming. It's just, it's it's awful that's the question of what happens to these souls whose bodies have been so torn to pieces virgil says that on judgment day again there's judgment day mentioned again that everyone's soul will be reunited with their body and they will be in a state of perfection dante asks the question for the souls down here in hell while perfection may sound really cool in heaven what does perfect mean in hell and virgil's like well that means they're suffering will be perfect in other words a whole lot worse than it is right now see and this is what's really interesting about reading this story in the modern age any modern story that you would look at that would be in the setting the story would go from a state of fear or whatever negative emotion to a state of pity or remorse or love or acceptance or whatever however that was not the traits that was becoming at least to dante at the time instead 
Dante's journey or character arc through this story is going from pitying these souls to being happy that this is the punishment they're receiving because as the inscription on the gates of hell said at the beginning this is just and perfect punishment so according to the story it's good that as it goes on dante begins to lose emotion and remorse for these people instead viewing it as a perfect form of punishment that we should all be proud of so in this moment whenever virgil says well their suffering will be perfect that's not supposed to be a bad thing. That's the wise Virgil being like, now don't you worry readers, it's gonna get worse. So anyway, they continue <laughs> on their path and get to the fourth layer of hell. I think, I don't know, again, like God is just, but hell is very sad. Like that whole, a place of torment like that is just brutal. But I, that's, again, we as humans, we can't comprehend it, I don't think, because we our definition of good does not even remotely match God's. So when we try to like argue with God, like, oh, well, he's good enough. It's like, well, no, God's perfect. And the book of James makes it pretty clear, like, if you've broken one part of the law, you've broken the whole, you've broken everything. Like, that's it. You, you're guilty of sin, and you're deserving of punishment from that. Like, and... As God says to Adam and Eve, if you sin, you're guilty of death. And so that's just, that's the punishment. And so, but it's very sad. I would never, again, I would never be like, oh, I'm going to heaven and you're going to hell. Like it's, that's not how Christ wants us to live. And, you know, God is just, and there'll be a time when he eventually has to pour out his wrath, just like he did in the flood. And, but even then, God offered the ark to Noah. And so right now we're in that intermediate time in that interim time before he pours it out again. And as right now as Christians, our job is to preach the good news, just like Noah preached the good news that there, it was going to rain and nobody believed it. And then it did rain and then everybody believed it. But at that point it was too late. And the same thing, like in this time that we have, that we make it count that we don't just like, live for ourselves and that we're Christians that we try to like beat our chest and they go like, Oh, we're so awesome. Like there are real life stakes at hand, whether you live in America or whether you live in China or, you know, Germany or whatever country you live in, like there's real life stakes. Like there are people who don't know Jesus and the reason they don't know Jesus is because they don't, they haven't seen anybody live like Jesus. They haven't seen anybody live like the gospel. And so they just see Christians like arguing and being hypocrites and doing it. They're just a bunch of, do this, do that, and not, you know, actually living, being filled with love, being filled with joy. They're just kind of like, you know, kind of like the fair, like living like a Pharisee, just trying to burden people, but not necessarily take them the burdens off. They're trying to, you know, establish rules, follow this command. Like, I, and I've said this before too. I think behind the pulpit, we're we're more Christians. Sometimes we get more concerned with making people act like Christians than we are with getting them to actually know Christ. Because if people act like Christians, we don't feel like the need to preach the gospel to them. Which is wrong, because, again, if we were guilty of one part of the law, we're guilty of the whole thing. But, again, as Christians, like we want to be comfortable, and so we're more concerned with getting people to act like Christians than we are getting to get them to know Christ. And that's the wrong objective. Christ wants us to, you know... Get people to know Christ because if you don't know Christ then the whole then you're still lost so it shouldn't concern us if somebody it should still concern us even if somebody is acting like a Christian if they don't know Christ rather than being like oh well they they're good enough in my book so you know whatever I'm just gonna forget about them and let them be or whatever it's you know we do have a responsibility I'm trying to word this right we have a responsibility and Christ called us to go make disciples and Christ called us to live out the gospel, not just preach it. Don't just preach the gospel. Don't just preach Jesus. Live it. Genuinely live it. And it's a hard thing to do and you're going to make mistakes, which again, that's why you don't act like a know-it-all because you're going to slip up. But a real, you know, mature Christian will own up to that. Say, you know what? I messed up. Even if whether a non-Christian calls out the sin, whether a Christian calls out the sin, you just stand up and say, you know what? 
that was wrong of me. And I'll own that. And you just, again, you keep living out your day-to-day life with Christ. And you try to model that. And you just want to share the love of Christ with everyone. Because, I mean, like Christ says, if you actually understand heaven, if you actually understand how great eternity we have with God, why would you want to keep that to yourself? Why would you just want to hide that under your bed or under a bushel or whatever you want, whatever illustration you want to use? Like, it's such a great thing. And so we should be joyful. We should be, you know, going neighbor to neighbor, even if they reject us and say they don't want anything to do about anything to do with Christ, like still loving them. There's no reason for us to not love others, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, because Christ said to love both. Pray for those who love you. Pray for those who don't. Pray for everybody. Love those who don't love you. Love those who don't. Like, that's, it's a simple command, It's but it's not easy. And that's, but it's something to chase. And it's something that Christ wants us to chase. And so, living out the gospel. You know, I talk about it a lot, but it's, it's important and we don't like growing up in the Southern Baptist church. Sometimes you hear more about, you know, telling others what to do, but not necessarily living it. But the thing about Christ's ministry is he lived it and he said it. But the reason people will listen to what he said is because he lived it. He lived it out loud. When he prayed for his enemies, what did he do on the cross? He prayed for his enemies. And so he lived it out loud. Whereas, we want to live. We want to tell people what to do, but we don't live it out loud. It's like, oh, do this, and then we don't do it, and it's that's a turnoff. And so, again, we want people to know Christ, and if they aren't acting like Christians, then that's not a surprise. Because if I didn't know Christ, I wouldn't act like a Christian. If I didn't believe in Christ, I wouldn't go to church. I wouldn't, you know, to believe the things I do and do this or that. Like my life would be completely different. So why is it like so? Like, we're offended when a non-Christian sins. It's like, they don't know Christ. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I would be in that same situation if I didn't know Christ. Like, it's, I don't know. We get too caught up on Pharisaic stuff still. And it's not what God wants from us. You know, be forgiving because Christ forgave us. And we have no place to stand here. I mean, we should, in love call out sin but we don't make it you know when we're calling out the sin we don't make it a platform to make ourselves feel better about ourselves like well i'm doing better than you and you're a sinner so haha it's okay you know i love you as a brother or a sister or as a friend and i just want to you know i see this going on and i care about you and i just want you to know this is what i see like being caring and just not immediately putting somebody down which we get backwards a lot in Christianity, and it's sad because Christ is really awesome. But, you know, as Christians, we don't represent him well at all. And he forgives us. He's very forgiving. He's very patient with us. But, you know, it's like he says throughout his whole ministry, like when he comes back to earth the second time, who's going to have the faith? Who's going to actually be living the gospel? Or is he going to find us, you know, in that comfort zone and our gluttony, trying to just indulging, just enjoying life and not really, you know, living for him, just living for ourselves, taking our salvation for granted. So it's living out the gospel. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I think that's uh, a good way to end this video. I think, uh, we're going on to the fourth layer now and I, uh, we got five more, got a few more, well, we got nine layers, so we got, we got a few more. Um, anyway, thank you so much for watching. I really enjoyed this. Um, <laughs> it's very deep, <laughs> and I hope my ramblings make sense. I feel like my ramblings were a little bit more off on this one. <laughs> I was trying to make it make sense, and I don't know if they did, but anyway, thank you so much for watching. Uh... Let me know if you'd like to see a part two, if there's other Wendigoon videos you'd like to see. I'm, again, really enjoying reacting to his videos. I love the effort he puts into it. I love the research he puts into it. I learned so much. I learned so much in the Lost Books ser series, so 
you know, massive thanks again to Wendigoon for making these videos. Really appreciate it. And yeah, um, I'm also going to try and not uh, <laughs> take four days off again between videos. I'm going to try and get a little more content out. I got a little bit caught up with uh, Christmas shopping because I didn't do any Christmas shopping. And I was like, oh, wow, Christmas is this Sunday. So I should probably do something. So <laughs> didn't uh, get time to make videos, but I'm trying to get back into it. Uh, again, like I mentioned, there's a Paradox video I'm really interested in doing that will be coming out. And then uh, I've been getting recommended to uh, react to like heavy metal lyrics. So I'm curious about doing that too. Hopefully, again, like in the new year, I'll have a more like standard scheduling than what I was doing. Because I was doing daily content and I enjoyed it, but it was a little bit too much. So I'm trying to find like a middle ground where I can be flexible, but also make enough content. But anyway, I'm trying to figure that out. But anyway, again, thank you to everyone so much for all the support. Who, everyone who likes, subscribes, comments, like it means so much to me. And so thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know what you think in the comments, if my ramblings made any remote sense. And if they didn't, <laughs> let me know too. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video.